I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. I'm Chad Davis, and this is Romans 116 Radio. Good morning, my beloved. It's good to see the house of God filled with those who are eager to draw near. And you know, the Spirit of God is rich among us and obvious this morning in the singing of God's praise and the reading of God's word and the giving of offerings. And if you're not catching on to that spirit, let me tell you, let me tell you that Sunday isn't all there is. Sunday is the celebration of a life lived in the presence of God. So if you're not, if you're not feeling the Holy Spirit moving among us, then come prepared next week. Spend some time before the Lord this week. Get ready for worship next week. Now, it's not all about how you feel and if your hair stands on end, not, not at all. But this ought to be the high moment of our time together. Psalm 15 has been on my mind and the Lord's been dealing with me in Psalm 15, I'm guessing about two months because I remember a conversation I had about it as far back as June 21st. The Lord's been convicting me and talking to me and showing me what it is that he has in mind for us in Psalm 15. Let me read it to you from the New International Version. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous. Who speaks the truth from their heart. Whose tongue utters no slander. Who does no wrong to a neighbor. And casts no slur on others. Who despises a vile person. But honors those who fear the Lord. Who keeps an oath even when it hurts. And does not change their mind. Who lends money to the poor without interest who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. You know, I would just like to let the Word of God speak this morning. Really, I probably should do that. But I know that in America in the 21st century, we are stuck on theology. Theology is not bad until it gets in the way of hearing the Holy Scripture. It's a good thing because we have to figure out how we're going to think about God. That's what theology is. But sometimes we love that theology so much, we just resist the Word of God when we hear it. See, I know that I'm going to post this on YouTube. And I know that somebody's going to say, you're preaching work salvation. They're going to get a question that this, this psalm doesn't even ask. This psalm doesn't say anything about how does one get saved. But somebody is going to, is going to sharpshoot and say... Salvation is by faith alone. So let me just affirm that up front. Let me just tell you, the gospel of salvation is by God's grace alone. It is God's grace alone that saves you. And the only thing you can do to bring that about is believe the message he has asked you to believe. Depend upon him alone for your salvation. Because it doesn't come from your good works. Are we good? So lay aside any kind of confusion that I'm talking about you get saved by doing something in Psalm 15. Christians tend to get stuck in these categories and they present this false choice between faith or works. But don't you know that God has desired for you to have faith and do good works? You know, the scripture says, this is not a a discussion of salvation by faith or works. That's a question that I'm not talking about. Now that we're clear, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10 says this, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this, not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you know that just because you're saved, it does not wipe away the idea or the necessity, the requirement of God that you do right? 
You can say, well, I'm saved, but I'm going to live any way I want to. I, I question how saved you are. But the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we sin so that grace may abound? And there in the Greek is the strongest negative possible. May genoito. May it not be. Your Bible might translate it, God forbid. But it is the strongest way to say no in Koine Greek. No, you cannot say just because I'm saved I can live like the devil. No. But how does God want you to live? Let me just tell you. Let me just tell you, even though, no, no, not even though, especially because we are God's children, the Lord expects us to be righteous. Salvation is not your path on righteous. It is your path to righteous. What you couldn't do in the flesh, you can do in God's spirit. And I'm going to lay it out for you as plain as I can, because God has been telling me, I'm thinking seven weeks now, Chad. Did you not read Psalm 15? Chad, what was that you said about your brother in Christ? And I clap my hand over my mouth. And right there, the text jumps out of me. Cast no slur on others. You know, but Lord, it's true. And the Lord says it doesn't matter if it's true. I don't want your mouth speaking ill of my child. Psalm 15. It's power. Read it. R write it down. Put it, put, it, put it on your desk so you see it in the morning. Put your, put your ribbon in your Bible in there and look at it again and again. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mount? Now, what does that mean? To dwell in the Lord's sacred tent. To, to live on the holy mount. Well, David writes this psalm in the time of the tabernacle, when Israel associated the tabernacle, a big tent, and specifically the Ark of the Covenant with the presence of God. In David's mind, where the tent was, where the Ark was, on that mountain there, where the temple later stood, was where God's presence was. David is saying, who can be in the presence of God? Do you know you could be my blood relative and not be welcome in my house? But you're still my blood relative. You know what I'm saying? Do you know that no matter what my sons and daughter do, I will love them with my whole heart, but it's going to affect the way that I feel about them at the moment? Don't you think that God has some expectations that you walk uprightly before him? Don't you think it affects the way God feels about you at this moment? Yes, I know God loves you. Yes, I know he got, God loves you no matter what. Once he has made you his child, you're his child. You know what? Rhett Davis, Brittany Krebs, Brennan Davis, Alex Krebs, they can do nothing that I will cast them off for it. Nothing. They can hurt me, though. And anybody who's a parent knows that they're probably going to do that sometimes. David is saying, do you want fellowship with God? Not a question of salvation now. It's a question of fellowship because how we act influences the way that God looks at us. I want to please God. God wants you to please him, to obey him, to honor him, not just with your lips. We're going to get into the details in this psalm here. David's talking about fellowship with God. And the apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 6, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. He says, if we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You walking in darkness? Don't tell me. It's not the time to raise your hand. Maybe in about 15 minutes. But if you're walking in darkness, don't pretend that you have fellowship with God. God wants you to walk in the light. Let your deeds come, come clean. Come clean with God. Verse 2. The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart. This is about spiritual integrity. Walking blamelessly, doing what is right. These are positive commandments. These are positive, yes, I said the word, commandments. Walk 
blamelessly. Do what is righteous, tzedek. Speak the truth from your heart. You know, I had a conversation with my friend on June 21st. And I was reading the psalm. And she says, oh, but who's blameless? No one's blameless. Well, you know what? The Bible says there's none righteous, not one. It's not that we're talking about sinless perfection here. We're talking about walking blamelessly before God. Make it your priority to do nothing that offends him. And you want to know who's righteous? Do you want to know? Pat told me once in Chaplain, you're not righteous. I agreed with her. I'm not. You want to know who's righteous? The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not someone who's never sinned that's being talked about here. David knows darn well he's a sinner. It's someone who got up in the morning or paused at noonday or before they went to bed at night. They stopped and they took the time to do business with God and said, Lord, I forsake this sin. Cleanse me of it. Wash me of it. Don't ever let me fall into it again. It's someone who has done business with God. I want my life, although if anybody knew me well, they'd know. But look what he did. Look what he did. Look what he, look what he did. I have to confess every day. Every day. Sometimes I'm not sure if I sinned or not. Sometimes I know for sure. You with me? But I'm doing business with God. And the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Who does what is right. Who speaks the truth from their heart. I'm not going to be a liar because God knows the truth. You know, I found one place. I could, boy, I can lie at work. Boy, I can lie at church. Boy, I can lie at the house. I can lie on the Internet. You know, I found one place I cannot lie. In my prayer closet. I found out. I can't pull the wool over God's eyes one little bit. Whether I've got a reading light on or a candle or no light at all, his light penetrates to the very heart of the matter every single day. That's what you need to do is allow God access. Allow him to see and ask him, fill me with your spirit. Let me walk the way that you want me to walk. Now listen to the negative commandments, verse 3. Whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and who casts no slur on others. You know, I didn't think I had a problem with that until June 21st. And then I found out I talk about people more than I thought. Things come out of my mouth that they might be true. I might have legitimately been mistreated and done wrong by somebody, but I don't need to talk about it. It might be true. It doesn't matter if it's true. Here I am. Like the devil accusing another person. You realize that's what the devil does? That's his job is to say, look at Rhonda. Look at her, Lord. Look at her. I caught her. I caught her. I don't want to be in that line of work. I want to be in the grace and forgiveness and overlooking your faults and loving you despite what you might have said to me in days past. That's that's the, bit, the, the business I want to be in. Because Jesus looks on the sinner and he says, Neither, therefore, do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. That's the business I want to be in. You know what? If you hold a grudge, I fear for your eternal soul. We'll talk about that another day. But let me tell you, if, if you've got anger and hate and slander and slurs in your heart and you're willing to do wrong to your neighbor, no matter how justified you might feel in it, I worry. Don't worry, Preston Gospel. Do you know I pray for you every day? I do. Most of you by name. But I'm getting a lot of faces in here. I'm going to need a bigger napkin, I guess. But I pray for you. I pray for you be, because we're in this together. Because we're in this together. And, and we're not going to do wrong to our neighbor, Preston. We're going to love our neighbor because that's what Jesus called us to do. Who do you say to love? He said, oh, that Samaritan that you don't think you have any obligation to love, that's the one. That's who your neighbor is. 
Verse 3 is about how we treat others. Do you notice two of those three sentences have to do with what we say? James says the tongue is a very difficult thing to control, like the rudder of a ship. You know, pray for me. Pray for your pastor. I pray for you, but I'll be okay if you pray for me. I won't turn it away. I'll say, this is something that I'm, re I'm reckoning with. You know, the second commandment, the second greatest commandment according to our Lord Jesus is that you love your neighbor as yourself. Don't wrong him. Don't wrong her. Don't talk bad about her. Don't talk bad about him. Don't lie on him. And don't tell the truth on him when it's, when it's an accusation. Be kind, as our Lord Jesus was kind to you. Verse 4 is a hard verse. I'm going to break it in half. Still a hard verse. It says, who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord. This one's difficult. But are you willing to hear the Holy Scripture? Our theology says we've got to love everybody. I thought, I thought about this long and hard. I, I, I flip back and forth through the book over and over. The Holy Scripture goes against our modern interpretation of the gospel here. Because Jesus commanded us to love one another. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we have to love everyone. I know. That's the way we've been talking. That's the way we've been interpreting Jesus. But I read this. This is not my, my book. I did not write this book. This isn't my verse, verse 4. I didn't write this verse. King David, at least definitely the Holy Spirit, wrote this word here that says, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord. A nice easy way out of that, which I just don't think really works, is, well, I can love the sinner and hate the sin. I think you might want to love the person, but you can despise what they do. In fact... This is a measure of our holiness, that we are offended when God is offended. When God says, I detest, fill in the blank, that cannot be okay with us. That cannot be okay with us. If God says this is wickedness, we have to go, oh no. Not under my care, not in my family. No, I will not approve of what God has said is vile. That word vile is not my word. That's the Holy Spirit's word. Yeah, it's hard. And I don't have that fully worked out. But that stands out in this text as a surprise. Isn't that great when you read the Bible and you actually learn something? Amen. And you go, wow, I didn't know that was in there. Well, sometimes this one's hard. This one's hard. But I'll make peace with it because I'm commanded here to despise a vile person. But to honor those who fear the Lord. And I love it that I can honor you when you fear the Lord. I love it when as the more I get to know you find folks at Prussman Gospel, and I've been here a couple years, if you're new, I've been here a little while. The more I get to know you, the more I see your heart for God. None of you are perfect, me especially. But I see your heart for God. I see your commitment. I see Matthew who has been through a very trying year this year. He talks about, he talks about last year, but this year, do you mind, brother? He lost his sight. He lost his driver's license. It's been, a, it's been a struggle. But Matthew is a faithful prayer warrior, praise warrior, up here lifting up God's head. And he says, oh, oh, if it wasn't for the Lord. And you know, Matthew's like a broken record, but he says, I trust God, I trust God, I trust God, I trust God. That's a good thing. The more I know you, the more I want to honor you for your faithfulness and for your desire to know and to please God. The second half of verse 4 says, Who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. This has to do with our integrity. Even when it's inconvenient, a righteous man does the right thing, keeps his word, doesn't change his mind. Our Lord Jesus said, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Many... Many turn away from God when circumstances of life don't go their way. I mean, I, I can't count the number of conversations I've had when I said, do you, do you believe in God? So, well, I used to until, and then they tell you the bad thing that happened. Like God was supposed to protect them from every bad thing, and since God didn't, he must not exist. Please. That doesn't pass any test of reason. 
Not at all. But many said, turn away from God when it's hard to follow him. When the temptation is there, we think, well, I can always confess my sins later, right? God says, hey, the righteous man keeps an oath even when it hurts. And he doesn't change his mind. Job said, I've been reading Job, and I love Job. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though, you know that word slay means to violently kill. What? God stripped Job of every last comfort and everything he had of value. And he said, though he's kill me, yet will I trust him. I'm going to do a funeral for a suicide tomorrow morning at 8.30. I knew the man. I didn't know him well. But my best friend knew him well, and he's beside himself with grief. That's why I'm going. That's why I'm going to put on a black suit and miss half a day of work, and I'm going to go to that cemetery. Because I don't want my friend's faith to slide. The civil rights movement in the United States had a theme. We shall not be moved. Have you heard that? I got my big fat Martin Luther King book out looking for that. I couldn't find it. I don't think he actually said it. But the idea in the civil rights movement is we are making an unrelenting, uncompromising demand for justice. For God's highest good, for right to be done. This is what it means to not change your mind. Serve God even when it hurts. Make your stand even if everyone turns against you. Speaking for me and speaking for you, we shall not be moved. Think of Natalie Grant and her beautiful song by the title, I Shall Not Be Moved. She says, I will stumble, I will fall down, but I will not be moved. I stand for one thing. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's it. You know what? I love my country, but you don't see political things on my Facebook page because I've got one thing to say to the internet. One thing. Believe in God. Amen. That's all I've got to say. That is my stand, and I will not back off of that. I might take a picture of my food one day and put it on there. My dog. Probably my dog. But I only have this one talking point anytime somebody gives me a mic. Jesus Christ, crucified for our salvation, raised to life, exalted to the right hand of the Father, King of kings and Lord of lords. I shall not be moved. Verse 5. Who lends money to the poor without interest? Who does not accept a bribe against the innocent? This, this verse talks about how we handle our money. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you know it talks about money all the time the time. Far more than it talks about adultery. Far more than it talks about lying. The Bible talks about money a lot because it is a wonderful thing when God gives it to you and a terrible hazard if you don't use it the way that you ought to. We should use our money for good and mercy. For good and for mercy. Who lends money to the poor without interest. I don't really like to lend money. I just assume to give it away because I'll probably be mad at you when you don't pay me back. <laughs> so I probably just, if you need something, just tell me. I'd probably rather just write the check and we'll, be, and we'll be good. But the Bible says he lends money to the poor without interest. I'm told that if you give a handout to a panhandler, that doesn't help. I wonder who, who decided that doesn't help. I wonder who decided that they all make fifty or $60,000 a year and live in nice, comfortable houses and they go stand out there on the corner. That might be somebody, but that's not everybody. Last summer, at the corner of Hancock and Academy, I saw a man I thought was going to die of thirst. Last month, I saw a woman passed out in the sun in the grass out in front of Ace Hardware. My money is far less important than that woman. 
I'm not going to say anything else about it. I just I want you to tell, to tell you. What you use your money for will have something to do with God's opinion of you every day. There'll be a time when God says, stop the car, feed that man. And there'll be a time when you can just keep on driving. It'll be fine. But the word of God says, I don't have the verse written down here. It says, he who stoppeth his ear at the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be heard. And you go, oh, not me, man. I've got, I've got a stack of money back there. How about in the afterlife? How about when God judges you for the way that you hoarded your money and didn't share it and you didn't care for somebody who had less than you had? Megan bought me a bunch of shirts yesterday. I look at the number of coat hangers in my closet and God may judge me, I'll tell you. I need to find a way to do something right with the rest of those shirts that she didn't buy me yesterday. You with me? Don't, don't let the accumulation of possessions threaten your relationship with God. You say, Lord, why aren't you hearing my prayer? Why, why are you so far from hearing me? Why are you not answering me? What if the Lord said to me, 185 shirts, Chad, that's why. I don't think I have that many, but I got a lot. I got a lot of shirts because sweet Megan loves me. She goes out and buys them for me. Now, I need to do the right thing. I need to do the right thing with my money. Or one day. I may find myself in judgment. I may find myself in want. I might find myself someplace outside the ta tabernacle, someplace down below the foot of the holy mount, longing for the relationship with God that I think I want to have. But I haven't done what God expected me to do. Now, don't take that positive statement all by itself. Look at the negative statement. Who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. You see, money can influence you to do evil. Right? You ever heard that? Every man has his price. My price? The precious blood of Jesus. Nothing else. I'm watching out that I'm not greedy. I'm watching out. Thank you, Leroy, for your preaching a year and a half ago remind me that that was a snare and a trap that I was stepping my foot in. Thank you, brother. A year and a half ago. We could do the wrong thing if we have money. Right. Besides just keeping it to ourselves, we could, money could influence us to do evil. Mm -hmm. Don't think that there will not be a judgment when you are called to account for every word that you've said, and I'm going to add every dollar that you spent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. I think it's Psalm 16. That should be right on here on the same page, right? I'm not seeing it. Here it is, verse 8. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. There it is on the same page, Psalm 16. See, see this is it. You want to be secure? You want the world... To, to revolve around you and God's blessings to just pour out onto you? Do you want things to go well with you? Do these things. We shall not be moved. A steadfast, unyielding commitment to justice is what God wants from us. I say justice. That's the word sedek, just like the word righteous. It means the thing that God desires. God promises to secure our place. In Christ, we shall not be moved. The ones who fulfill the commandments in this psalm, grants, God grants security to them. Not necessarily worldly security. Yeah, your house can still burn down. Yep, someone you love can still die. Yep, that beautiful car that you're driving that you love so much, it can still end up a pile of fiery rubble. It can, you know, Cadillacs rusting in the junkyards, the words from the old song. That can still happen. But the security that I'm offering you is a fellowship with God that is sweet. The security I'm offering is you is that you will be welcome in the most holy place. That in the sanctuary of the Lord, there will be a spot for you. That on his holy mountain, literally or figuratively, God will welcome you because he will see you uh, through, the blood, through the lens of the blood of Jesus. But he will see you as someone who seeks his face and does his will. Amen. How on earth, Chad Davis, am I ever going to do Psalm 15? See, I just gave you an ought to sermon. I'm going to give you a how-to sermon. Uh, I'm already at 29 minutes, so I'm going to go quick. 
How on earth can you ever do these things? It's not our nature, right? Well, it happens in prayer. It happens in prayer. Number one, submit yourself to God. I won't quote it. Just go look in the book of James. You'll find it there for yourself. Chapter 4. Be honest with God about your sins and your temptations. Set your intention to please God above everything else. That's, that should be your battle plan. That should be your battle plan. I am going to please God above everything else. And then you'll be sanctified. That's what I'm preaching on today, sanctification. There, you want to talk about doctrine, there's your doctrine. But here's what the Bible says, 1 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, who do you think produces the fruit of the Spirit? Anybody? The Holy Spirit. Then the answer is you can't do it. But you can ask God to do it in you. You can submit yourself over and over. You can acknowledge your struggles and your failures. You can plead with God to forgive your sin and to remake you in the image of his son. And he's all about that transformation. You know, this is God's will for you and it's his greatest commandment according to Jesus. I just said this is the most important thing. Jesus said it was the greatest commandment. I'll read it to you in a little bit here. But don't you realize that the greatest commandment is a commandment against mediocrity? It is a commandment against hypocrisy. It is a commandment about being wishy-washy, ambivalent, lukewarm. That's the commandment that Jesus said was the most important. He also said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and few there are that find it. And I have given it to you in Psalm 15. You can find it. It's a commandment that we love the Lord our God with all yes, we've got. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And I'm going to turn my camera off because it's time for an altar call. 